Um, since uh, before I begin talking about our schools, I thought I'll give you a little perspective of comparison of Estonia and India because today we have an audience here who may not know a lot about India. <laughs> yes, I think um, the first number really uh, shocks you, right? Um, and we're, gr we're growing pretty rapidly at a 1.2% rate, and that's compared to, to Estonia. I just want to talk also that uh, we have a large audience who's viewing it right now from India, so a, a namaskar to all the, my fellow countrymen who are watching it back home. And for them also, for them to see where I've come in Estonia and how different this country is. So um, the GDP is one of the things that I want to share, uh, 22,000 over here for Estonia and um, 4,000 US dollars for India. So we come from a relatively poor country. When it comes to education, um, the median, uh, you know, one of the important facts is the third point, the school life expectancy. How many years a child studies in school in, um, and college in Estonia, 17 years, where we have 12 years. And the other thing is, so, we, so clearly you can see that it's a poor country and not a lot of children are coming to schools. We, had, we have to increase that. We have a 74% literacy rate. That means children who can read and write is just 74%. But in this year, 2016, 23,000 kids have been born in Estonia and 44 million have been born in India. And this is a rapidly growing age group of zero to 14. If you see, as a percentage, if you look at the last um, point over here, so you have 15% kids who are in the school age and we have 28% and this number is growing. So that's how the population graphs of India and Estonia look. So we have a younger population, a growing population, whereas Estonia needs to, uh, has, has a significantly decreasing population in the younger years. And this, uh, this um, the important thing is um, to show you is that the before working age, the light blue section over here is kids who are not working, I mean, who are in school, the younger age, you have 15.6% kids and we have 28.5. And very soon, India will have one fifth of the world's working population. One fifth of the world's working age population is gonna be from one country, India. So it's a massive task of educating this future generation. Again, to give you an idea of the context that I'm gonna be speaking on, so we have preschools in India, which are from age two to four year old children go, and that is the first time they leave home. Then we, after they, they reach the age of three and a half, they go to formal schools, which is the K-12 schools, from the age of three to 17, and they do their class 12. So that's it's mostly one integrated school from kindergarten to uh, grade 12. And the preschools tend to be in the neighborhood community, so there'll be multiple preschools in an area. Then undergraduate, studies three to five years, three years for the, mostly the, uh, the fine arts, the sciences, and up to five years, four years for engineering, five years for medicine. And then post-graduation takes normally two years. So that's how we progress. We have a little bit of vocational education, we have a little bit of open schools, uh, open universities, but that's a very small part of um, the UK. This is a, what the majority of kids uh, go through. And of course, we have two kinds of educational institutions. We have the government ins institutions and the private schools. The private schools are mostly under the, as non-profits. So there are charities, there are Catholic schools, there are run by entrepreneurs. So a lot of private schools and government schools. And why do private schools exist in India when government is educating our children free of cost? There's a huge shortage of teachers right now. 120,000 teachers are required right now in our schools. So you can imagine there are kids who are coming to school and there are no teachers. And those teachers who are coming to government schools tend not to come to school. They don't show up. So one, A, of course, we have a shortage of teachers, and second is due to lack of accountability, teachers are not com coming. So there's no accountability in the government school systems. And even if they do, we appoint a teacher, she does show up to school, the, tr the way she's teaching is in the most uninteresting manner, irrelevant manner, which, and that leads to a huge dropout. So overall, this, that's what the government school scenario is. We've actually, it's not working at all. Um, and we have challenges apart from ICT is a far-flung dream for most schools. Is, look at this number, 10% lack 
drinking water. When you look at basic needs, you look at internet as your basic need or, or high-speed Wi-Fi, 10% schools don't have drinking water, and that's something in a hot country like India. 40% lack a functional toilet. This is a government, so yeah, I'm just giving you an example of why, why would somebody choose not to go to a pr government school and pay money to come to a private school is because government schools are doing nothing. And 60% of schools, if you see on the right, are not electrified. There's no electricity at, at all. And in areas where there is electricity, sometimes electricity comes for one hour, two hours a day, that's it. So you cannot just imp impose imp technology in such schools and hope it'll work. You can just see we have basic infrastructure issues. So the law, I don't mean to depress you here, it's one of the last sessions, but we are home to one third of the world's illiterates are, are in, our, in, our, in, our, in our, my country. And this number is growing, as you saw, a growing population, and we have a shortage of 200,000 schools in the country. So it's not just about building schools, it's about creating those world-class infrastructure for children of the future. We talk about 21st century skills, and here we are still, some of the schools still are in dark ages. But there is hope. The hope is in technology-powered, quality private schools at an affordable price. So we have set up our schools. Our school chain was started in 1989, and today we have 525 preschools, primary schools, K-12 schools, all across the country, in Nepal, Bangladesh, as well. And today we're one of the world's fastest growing school chains. Just to give you an idea of the growth, in the last two years, we have set up 340 schools in two years. That means one school every alternate day. That's the kind of growth that we're experiencing right now because there is a huge demand from parents for good private schools. So if we can, we have actually made it like a systematic process where we set up the schools, identify locations, identify teachers, train the teachers, advertise for students, and that's how. And all these systems are in place, and I'll talk about how we're using ICT. So we have two brands for our schools. Shemrock is our preschools, the two to four-year-olds, and Shemford is our K-12 school chain. So these operate under a franchise model where there's an entrepreneur who says, okay, I want to set up a school, but I really don't know how to run a school. I cannot set up a world-class school, but there's a huge demand in my community for a good school. How do I do it? So they approach a company like us, we, which we, are where we franchise a brand and the systems and the quality controls and so everything, it is a bit of McDonaldization, but that's what the country requires. I know teachers over here would scoff at that idea where we have put in systems in place, lesson plans, activities, but when you have teachers who cannot teach at all, who have no exposure to good teaching methodologies. That's the best way to ensure that that child who's studying in a remote location in our country gets access to really good research and develop back the uh, R&D backed education. So what we do is, I'll not talk about too much about what we do is, but we write from the curriculum, the school setup, this training, recruitment, marketing, IT, a lot of ongoing support so that each school is known as a quality education. And uh, Every year, the numbers of, we are growing in numbers by around 20,000 children per year are increasing in, in our schools. And that's the curriculum that we have. So we've adapted the 21st century skills model, and I'll not go over it, but that's the kind of um, whole school in a box package that we have that we give to people who are setting up schools. So the first school was started in 89 uh, in Delhi. And uh, of course, we've grown since then. Um, growing very rapidly, and I gave you an idea of the number of schools that we opened the last two years, so I'll not talk too much. A lot of awards, of course, when you do have experience growth, a lot of awards have been coming uh, to us um, as well, and so, again, awards, a lot of media buzz, a um, lot of uh, interest. I mean, thank you, Hitsa, for calling me as well, and um, I've been speaking at conferences last six months in Singapore, Hong Kong, there in uh, Abu Dhabi, I was there last week, and the challenges of ICT remain the same the world over, and I've, no matter how different we are from you, uh, the challenges that we face, and I've been talking to some of you in the last few days, remain the same. We are essentially following the same uh, you know, challenges. As we're growing rapidly, I'm also not just educating children, I'm recruiting almost all the time. N nearly 30% of my time in office is spent on recruitment, getting good people to join our team who can manage this, 
this level of unprecedented growth. I don't know of any country across the world where an institution is setting up schools every alternate day. So well, I look for these 21st century schools. I'll not talk about them because, of course, we're all aware of them. But I don't get them from my whole school system is just geared to producing students who can memorize facts and write them down in exam with good, clear handwriting. And I don't require that. And my own schools are producing these kind of students. So there's a challenge here. But this is what I require. I see what industry requires. I, I talk to fellow entrepreneurs, startups. All. So here we are, a poor country, high unemployment rates, and also companies complaining that we can't find people to, to fill in those, those uh, jobs. I recruit normally out of 300 people who apply for a single position, I recruit one out of 300 people. So 299 people who think they're eligible for that position that I've advertised for, don't get that position because it's something inherently lacking. And I blame it on the school system. And 40% of new entrants, and this research is not from India, it's from US, that 40% of companies are unhappy with the kind of students that our schools are producing. This is not an Indian thing, this is a Western thing. So it's the same, what I'm kind of trying to say is what challenges that we have in India are similar to what the West is also. So we have problems, the employers are not happy the, about the kind of things we're producing. Kids are not happy because these, this generation has been wired differently. They look at information very differently. The way I was brought up or you and I were brought up, we had a book, we had a teacher who told us everything and we were expected not to question and learn those things, give it in the, and write it down in the exams, and be a good student. But today, these children are wired, basically their programming is, um, their operating system is different. And we as adults, the challenge is that we who are supposed to create this new system for the, this generation have no idea because we've not been programmed for that. It's like me having to create a curriculum for Estonian language. I don't know your language. How do I create a curriculum for that? Similarly, we as adults who don't understand technology the way the digital natives have, are being expected to create a system. So the future of school will become, what will school look like? Why should children come to school? People, children are already questioning things like, why are you teaching me handwriting? I've never seen my father write. You, yet you, for eight years, we teach our children to do one page of cursive writing every day in our schools. Why is it important? And children start questioning that. And as people start questioning, as parents start questioning, what will happen is the role of schools will change. The role of the teacher will change from that of an information provider to a facilitator. So how will schools look? That's a question that we think about every day. How will schools look in the future? Will they become like less of information providers, more of community centers, that pat on the back from the human, which cannot be replaced by a well done message on your iPad, it's not the same. So will that be the role of teachers? So there's clearly pressure on schools to change from parents, from the industry. The world around us is changing. To give you an example, for me to be here, for Estonia to ever hear about some guy in India who's setting up these schools, to me being here, to today webcasting this to hundreds of schools in India who are watching this program right now is, and yet schools are still the same. So technology is changing, so everything is changing, the world around us is changing, the students are changing, but schools still look the same. And I have been to some schools, I was in a school this morning as well, and I don't think they've changed. The painting on the, the left, this, this is a 150 years old. This is early 90, uh, 20th century, and this is how, when we call a smart classes in our schools. So basically the same thing, teacher delivering lectures, kids, listening, making notes. And that's what a school system in India today looks like. And again, more across the world, you have to educate you on the ways of the world. This, the curriculum is government propaganda, imposing buildings, uh, there's constant surveillance with, with cameras and everything, right? Attendance is mandatory, you can all go through. That's how a school is defined, right? Right? These are attributes of a school. And if you were to change this, to today's prison system, all of them apply. So here we are, we've created a model to educate the future of our country, world and our country, and for those who are breaking the laws, and if some could call the scum of the uh, population, 
we ha basically have the same systems for both kind of people. So there's, and what are we teaching? It's a complete mess, right? That's what we teach. It's a complete mess. It's nothing to do with what the world is outside. It's math, English, Hindi, social sciences, science, I think same thing all, all across the world. So can you see how out of tune schools are with the real world? But so why is change slow? I think we all understand this. Everything is changing around us, but schools still remain the same with the teacher and so there's a lack of, and I'll talk more from why it's slow in India. Lack of qualified teachers, we have lack of computers, technologies is expensive and as an administrator, as a manager of a school, I need to look at ROI. What kind of return does an investment give? So should I, instead of investing in more technology in, in tablets or in smart boards, would I be better off investing that money in recruiting more teachers, training them? Would that be a better use of my money? So technology for the sake of technology, technology as a photo opportunity is not a good idea. I don't believe in that. I'm a software developer myself, but that doesn't excite me that technology has to be there in our schools. It's okay, it's a tool that is there. And of course, there's a fear, fear of the teachers. They say, will we be replaced? And I say, if, if a technology can replace you, then probably you should be replaced. If that's all your, everything you're doing can be replaced by technology, I mean, I don't think there's really a place for you, and that, that's going to happen as well. But again, I see the role of teachers being changed, not the fear, basically, the, you know, the teacher being replaced. As a, so we have internet is slow in our country, um, uh, and people are concerned about pornography, about privacy, about children being, and of course, in, in our schools, we also have to think about, okay, there's a 20% population who have access to iPads. There are 25% there people who don't have access to a phone at home. So there's a huge diversity of children studying here. So if you develop a system, for example, a flipped classroom where kids are supposed to watch a video and come to class prepared after watching that, what about if half the class does not have access to the technology? How does a teacher teach now? You have half the class who's watched the video, who's at a different level, and you have people who say, we can't help it. And, and like higher education, you, the onus is not on the child. It's beyond, it's something which they're helpless about. And there's a wide variation in what parents feel about technology as well. Some people say that it's good you don't have tech in your schools. They feel that kids are spending way too much time and they want real life, real world experiences. So parents' understanding of technology is very different. So we are in a, in a scenario where things have been slow, schools have been slow, and sometimes I feel it's the right thing as well. Experimenting and growing, and these are not, this is not a website or a startup which if it fails, it's okay. We're talking about kids' lives here, kids' futures here. Things, these, the things we do today will impact these children 50, 60 years from now. So it's okay to be a bit risk averse. You don't risk with, play risk with, uh, you know, risk with children's lives here because their futures are at stake. A website goes down, that's okay. Doesn't impact anybody. A startup fails, that's okay. Never mind, well tried, try again. But you can't do that with children's lives because a human being has, has been messed up because you were trying to experiment. And finally, Parents, don't experiment with my child. And that's not a typical uh, Indian parent, so just, I don't want to create some stereotypes here, but um, yes, parents would still want that, please, I don't care about all these critical thinking skills, 21st century skills. I want you, my child to get into this engineering college, this medical college. He has to get good grades. Because for a poor country like India, our, we look at basic survival needs as well. We cannot depend on the government to support us. So kids need, okay, if you can teach my ch children good English, they will get a job in a call center. That's like a social security net for them. If you can teach them programming, they'll become a programmer, and we are the programmers of the world. But again, the kind of programmers who don't have the creativity. So our programmers, if you tell us what to do, we'll code. But if you ask us to be creative, nobody wants to do that. Nobody has been trying to teach our children creativity. But things are changing. So when we go out there in the world outside of technology, when teachers look at technology, this is what they see. A huge range and every vendor, every company trying to sell their product, their solution as the, the final, you know, disruptive technology, if I can use the word, and this is going to change everything. And yet nothing changes. I mean, if you look at schools today and how they were a few years back, nothing has changed much. So there's so much happening outside. So how does School react to it. A lot of times it's just a photo opportunity. In one of the states of India, 
they gave out free tablets to students and the government ran out of money to buy paper for the examinations and kids were asked to bring their own paper for the examinations. Sometimes these t the tech investments become marketing ideas, photo opportunities. You can see hundreds of people gathered here because somebody's hand gifting somebody a laptop and you can well imagine how well this technology is going to be integrated in the classroom. It's not, it's just a photo op. So what do we do at, why I've been invited, what do we do at Shamrock and Shamford schools? Where we have schools which are charging as low as 10 US dollars per month, per month as a fee structure, to something which is $100 as well. So I have a huge diversity of, the country is so diverse that I have schools which are catering to the urban elite, and I have schools catering to the, the rural population, where they cannot afford basic food. They come and when they harvest their crops, they come with the money to pay the fee for the last six months because they didn't have any money all along while the, the farms were being cut. And whenever they sell, they produce, they, they farm on their land, they might have the money, they come and say, okay, I'll pay for the last six months fee, I'll pay for the next six months, just take whatever was due for you. And they see education as a way out of poverty. They see education as a way out of uh, the current rut that we are stuck in. So we've, so instead of looking at the whole chart of what is out there, we look at technology broken down to three simple ways. One for productivity, improving what we're doing, learning better, so as a teaching aids, doing things which we could not do earlier, so basically learning on steroids, and then to build 21st century skills, which we were not doing at all in our previous years. So for productivity, we've built our own software. It's an in-house developed software, so I told you I was a software engineer. So it's called ShemFast. Shem is the name, Shemrock and Shemford. That's where the S-H-E-M comes from. It also means uh, name and fame in Hebrew language. And F-A-S-T means uh, families and school together. So because it's about collaboration of the students and, and uh, the families and the schools as well. So we have a lot of features where this is used, basically used as a backend for managing our schools. Uh, we use it to manage inquiries, students, and I'll, I'll talk quickly about one by one. So all the admission inquiries that we come, so it's become like a CRM to uh, talk to people who had expressed interest, to follow ups with them, uh, managing the students, who, their addresses, their names, their f the fee details. There's a common inter interaction forum. So all the schools, a lot of knowledge sharing happening between the schools. So we have a Facebook kind of social media internally built in our own application where people are sharing ideas. All the curriculum for the teachers, what has to be taught, how it has to be taught, the lesson plans, the activities, the holiday homework, everything is ready made. So everything is powered by a research and development team at the head office. So every school is not reinventing the wheel. Every teacher does not have to think, okay, how am I gonna teach this concept very well? We say, here's a ready-made lesson plan for you. Just execute it. We back it up with a lot of training, especially with the multiple intelligence theory. So we help teachers take our lesson plan, take it to a higher notch by understanding how their children learn and adapt their teaching style to the, their, their own class. So, But as a basic standard, a basic minimum promise to the student or the parent is these ready-made um, curriculum that we have. So all the celebrations, if they're, so we are a very diverse country. We have Hinduism, Islam, Christianity. So we, we have a lot of uh, cultural functions. Every 15 days we have a holiday and something happening all the time. So we do celebrate Easter as well as uh, Diwali. And so a lot of, how do you celebrate it? To understand your rich cultural diversity, all those instructions are given. The instructions are given for parents. There are photo galleries for parents to watch what the children have been doing. Um, so alerts can be sent to parents if their fee is due, uh, if there's a parent-teacher meeting due next week, so you can always send alerts to them. Um, some learning resources have been built, rhymes. Also, to set up the school, since we are launching approximately four schools per week, how do we manage this growth? So this growth is also about, uh, the IT also supports all this growth. So the setup, hiring, training, just to give you a quick idea of, um, just quickly, and, and of course, Training, training. We, I feel the strong, the biggest percentage of your tech investment should actually go into training, rather than the actual technology itself. Technology is, should not be considered expensive. I think training is where budgets need to be allotted. And the challenge in India is that we are, since we are a large country, and I told, spoke about how big we are, uh, and culturally, women are not encouraged to move out of the the house. That's changing, but it's still there. Then it's not safe for women to travel alone sometimes some parts of the country. 
And even for my trainers who are women, I can't get them to keep traveling at 500 locations that I have today across the country. So how do I overcome them? The teachers cannot travel to me so regularly. I cannot send my trainers to so many locations. So we use webinars very extensively. Almost every day, we have a webinar training on some topic that the, teach the schools tell us about or the challenges we notice, and we try and embed that. So, for example, um, this was about how you start the morning assembly. So how do you, how are you supposed to conduct a morning assembly? So these are things which you, in a developed country, would consider as very basic, but teachers lack the knowledge. So we have a lot of webinar trainings uh, going on. And then we have all communication with the school, the parents, it's all documented. Um, and then we have quality audits, scores are ranked. We identify what are the areas of weaknesses, improvements for each school. And then what about admissions? Are admissions going up? Are they, because ultimately the money from the fee is what pays the salary. So that's a, a quick overview of the software that is powering our growth. It's uh, in-house built. I could not find anything like this in the market outside. So ultimately, I had to take a call. So we, had a, we have a team of developers in-house building this. So in technologies in the classroom that we're currently using, again, I have to customize what has to be used in every school based on where I understand that school is, how much fee the parent is paying, because ultimately, somebody the, the money for the technology has to come from the students itself. So I have to see how much their pa parents are paying, what is the ability of the teachers, how much do they understand technology, what kind of competition are they facing from other private schools, and we, we customize the tech requirements for every school. So it's not a standardized technology. Of course, the interactive whiteboard, the smart boards are there. We are using the student response systems for voting, which now we are looking at. There are apps which can now replace this, but we are still yet to move to an app and a mobile phone environment. So these are uh, clickers. I don't know how many of you know, but you can just Google it and find out what student response systems is. So teacher ask a question and kids respond through the clickers. Uh, visualizers where you, teachers can put the diary or a book or do a small experiment and through a projector it's, it gets beamed on the, the board. And that's I think is a very, um, it's not a very he heavily marketed tool but I think as a teacher it's, it's very, very strong that the, the teacher can just keep something there and the whole school, the class doesn't have to come all around the teachers and understand what's happening, what's happening. She can zoom in. I think it's, it's a fantastic tool that at least one school should have. We're using eBlocks to teach uh, English language in our schools. So this also encourages, as you see, the, the kids sit around the eBlocks. And what it is, it, it has a software like this running. Uh, and the questions, like any software, so what are the spellings of cat, for example? And kids have to put the blocks of C, A, T, and and it says, okay, go on. And they, so they learn how to work in a team as well. So it's not just individualized learning, which most softwares have, it's, it's a group learning activity. And that we are using in our kindergartens and our uh, pre-primary. Uh, as I was sharing, we have made the lesson plans, activities, there's a lot of content already available online. So we have not really developed digital content, but there's a lot of content which uh, is freely available. And we embed those lesson plans, PowerPoints, and give it to our teachers. So a lot of uh, digital content has been there. Recently this year we've started with QR codes as well. So a lot of our books have QR codes. If I'm teaching a concept, for example, of the water cycle and there's a QR code and kids can just open that and straight away on their father's phones because kids don't have access to technology in our country right now. So through their father's phone they can open a YouTube video of maybe or a video that we have created on how to teach the water cycle. And so that's been very powerful, uh, something that really brings uh, you know, the books alive. Then 3D labs, so we have these uh, uh, kids wear the glasses, things come out. So it's, it's a novelty factor. Kids love it when you know, the 3D experience enters their classroom as well. And because of uh, tech, I think a lot of kids who get disinterested with the traditional learning methods, when they have a variety of learning techniques, technologies in our schools, so they get super excited with that. We've also started using robotics labs in our, in our schools. So we have, apart from Lego Mindstorm, we have some in-house and, uh, sorry, Indian robotics companies who are working with us. And who've, Lego Mindstorm is very expensive for the Indian environment. So we have some uh, companies who've built uh, low-cost robotics labs. And kids learn the same programming methodologies. Because, again, as I, as I was talking about, this basic requirement of uh, getting children to learn basic programming, if I t teach them that, they have an excellent career, they may migrate to uh, a country they want to go to US, they can do that. So programming is a very sought after skill in now with parents. So robotics really is helping us there. 
And I was, as I was saying, English language as well. So the problem is a lot of cities, the teachers cannot speak good English as well because they are, they are, they've never had exposure to English language. So here you have where the teachers can't speak English and parents who expect children to learn good English because if you could teach children good English, they'll be very, very happy because at least for any profession today, all our business, everything, environment is in English language now. So we're using uh, English, it's a software where a child logs in, it's a personalized learning path through a software. In fact, at some of the schools, they've actually asked the teachers to do the, the software before the teacher. It was made for students, but teachers were asked that they should do it first, so spend three, four months doing it. So their English ability goes up, so they are speaking more English in the classroom as a result of these applications, and kids are thereby, since the interaction in the classroom starts happening in English, they, uh, uh, you know, the learning is much better. And then for building 21st century skills, we have already started piloting where kids are we're using PowerPoints, as I talked about, the interactive whiteboards. We are, we are um, using websites. And the fact that I, I could share that most of our schools are uh, watching this streaming right now in India is a, is a thing that shows that how we are now using it to observe. And then now kids are being encouraged to work on projects using technology. So they are now incorporating technology, thinking about how to Includes their productivity. So these pilots have started. And also creating content and creating things which will be relevant in the uh, workplace of tomorrow. But again, these are things where teachers are not very enthusiastic because they feel they don't have time. They, they have a curriculum which they have to finish. Parents think, how will this help them get good marks? So parents don't want it. Teachers don't want it. And kids are saying, OK, you're not going to grade me on this. It's not going to impact my grades, which are determined by the government, so why am I doing this? So parents don't want it, students don't want it, teachers don't want it, so why are we pushing this? I know it's for their own good. So we have to really make it exciting, embed social media, get, say, okay, who gets more likes will win. So we will be putting more and more enthusiasm in the children. When I feel when learning becomes more and more interesting and teachers also enjoy teaching, I'm sure uh, more teachers will actually come and join teaching as a profession as well. Because right now, when I ask a group of teachers when I'm we're doing the training, how many, of, how many of you was teaching the first profession, the first choice of profession? Very few hands go up. How many of you thought that, OK, when you were in school and high school, that you wanted to become a teacher? Very few hands go up. So as a result, teaching becomes a ch like the la last resort. And if we can make learning more interesting, if more private schools come, we're competing for the same teachers, the salaries would go up. I'm sure that would attract a larger number of teachers, people, uh, better people to this. And of course, now we're starting collaborating with using Web 2.0 schools. So these are, sorry, I, yeah. And the children are creating those things. But again, these are things which are still in the pilot stage. What I feel is the, the biggest thing is to focus on teacher training. So we research what are the best practices. We have a research-based team. We train. Then you have to build in the incentives for teachers. Why should I do this? Why are you telling me to do this? I can teach so well. Look at my results. Why, why do I have to change? You have to put in the right incentives. Then once you have used, identify teachers who have used this successfully, identify them as power users. Let them spread the word. Let the, power, uh, let the training happen from these power users. And then once you, then you put in standards, OK, this is how everybody's going to do it. On that feedback, and that loop has to continue. So even today, as a 25-year uh, organization, our school system, a lot of research happening. We are constantly following this loop, and our systems are constantly improving. Um, so that's what you need the vision, the skills, the incentives, the resources, and the action plan. Everything has to be in place. Otherwise, you can see the column at the side, what, hap what may happen. I'll not talk too much about it. but. And the option we've uh, seen is how, for anything, whenever we introduce anything new in tech in our school, it starts with, with a small group of people who take it up. Then the majority come. Then the rest of them say, OK, if everybody's doing it, we have to do it. And then I think everybody gets used to it. That's the adoption curve that. Uh, and how the majority of teachers, when how they use ICT in our schools is people learning how to basically how to move the mouse. So teachers still are asking, OK, if I move the mouse this much, how much will the pointer move? I still have teachers who are at that stage. So right from that stage where they're still, it's the first time they're touching a mouse. So they may have a phone, which is a smartphone. Today, a smartphone is in the hands of most teachers, but a desktop. So right from that stage, 
to how ch teacher, teachers become more and more mature with tech and how they use it is something that I've shared over here. So the questions we ask each other, um, ask ourselves every day is, um, in the future, how will the material be de delivered? Are we going to have a completely e-books or does it not make sense? Because today I know for a fact that I would prefer reading something on a paper and if it's a long article, I would still take a printout and read it. And so will e-books really be that, deliver that hype? How will children interact with each other? What, what will content be? How are we going to assess children? Because it's really cool to say personalized, adaptive learning, but what if you don't get it right? What if you've sent a child on a computer-generated path, which is not correct? As a human being, I can make changes. Okay, I, I thought this kid would be good in this, but okay, let, let him try this. A teacher can judge that, but when it's on a computer-generated path, it could com completely mess up the, uh, the, the children. So uh, we are building our apps. Since we've seen a lot of incorporation of mobile phones in our schools, in our community, we are building an apps with these features and those. Again, we're building it in-house. So when teachers ask me, I've, I speak at conferences across the world, what, what is the latest technology that we should think about? I don't think there is any. Simple things work the best. Whatever can be implemented, do it. There are simple things like Google Docs, Microsoft 365, which is free for all schools. Take risks. So keep it simple, take the risk, and don't try to look at an ideal digital school scenarios. Have your small victories and uh, as teachers, don't be scared to, and that's something which I keep encouraging teachers, don't be It's okay if you have to ask the students for help sometimes. And if everything fails in, with tech, um, always have a plan B. So finally, my last words are that um, for me as an Indian, for it's my duty, I feel that, to empower the children of the 21st century in our country. Otherwise, my, what could be, if we train them well, they will become my country's biggest asset. If I do not train them, I do not educate them, these children lost on the streets, running around on the streets, listening to whatever propaganda from crazy people over there would become the world's greatest liability. Thank you so much. Uh, Anna Willems from University of Tartu. Uh, do your materials are uh, open materials? Because really you have very many other private schools who are based on charity. Uh, for example, we very often support some schools in Hyderabad uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, can they use your materials? Okay, there are certain things which we share openly with, uh, of course, it's education, and certain things which keep as pro uh, proprietary as well. Because somebody who I'm, I'm encouraging to invest millions of rupees has to have something proprietary which the school next door does not have. And our system, we have um, the government curriculum that all the schools follow are structured very differently from how we do it. We have innovated in different ways. We follow a theme-based learning pattern. We have a curriculum which is so nobody can actually pick up something and use it in the classroom. It'll just become like, it's, it's like BMW handing over a tire and saying, would Ford want to use that tire? This, it doesn't fit into my car. So that's why it's not open, but uh, a lot of things that we do are freely available. A lot of trainings that we do, we encourage other schools to come and attend our trainings as well. A lot of knowledge sharing is happening and um, because of what we do, we have seen that the quality of education in the whole community and other schools also improves because they start learning from us. Those best practices get percolated. Our teachers leave our school, join another school and take those best practices as well. So there's a lot of, so the, I, I feel the research that we do is not limited just to our schools, but it's out there. But not all of it is available freely. So thank you for the good presentation. And uh, I really like that uh, even if, if you say that Estonia and uh, India is so different, we are so seeing everything is so similar in the same way. But um, what is your uh, recommendation maybe for, as you have traveled a lot, uh, for the Europe and in American countries, 
uh, and seeing their education because you can't take everything and you see probably something that we are doing wrong also. I think we're all at the same stage where, I, and when I go I, and speak at conferences in countries like Singapore, which is very highly uh, IT enabled, but the, those challenges still remain that this is what the kids of tomorrow would need. This is what my exam systems, my the entrance examination for the colleges requires this set, and there's a huge ma mismatch over there. So I think what uh, you have to look at, there's no, as I said, there's no single solution to and say, okay, MOOCs are the future, or flipped classroom is the future. Everything works in different contexts, and I think for teachers is that just keep experimenting. I think that's what we all have to get used to doing that as teachers and as educators, that there's no simple solution, and I, and I would say uh, that, you know, for the West, I think this is what they're missing, or for the India, this is what they're missing. It's, we're all in a phase where this whole technology thing has just hit us very hard in education, we are still trying to understand what's happening and how do we, uh, you know, incorporate this in our classrooms with so much curriculum has to be finished and we have to finish the syllabus, kids want this, the examinations, and, and at the same time, we know what we're doing is not what children would require when they enter the workplace. So I think the idea is that you have to constantly, teachers should take out time from their uh, schedules, try and see what, uh, and use technology not to keep reinventing the wheel. So a lot of, and I think already that's happening where best practices, lesson plans are already there, which teachers don't have to start from scratch. There's a lot of material out there. And fortunately, at the education sector, there's a lot of openness, a lot of sharing about what you create, unlike other sectors of, of the economy. So I think the, the main thing coming back to is, please take risks, small risks, not risk which will just mess up the children's lives, because that's not cool. And that's why I said it's sometimes good that we have not experimented too much. But to take the risk, share those feedbacks, and I think we all will continue to grow. And maybe I feel in 10 years' time, schools will look very different from the way uh, they are right now. There's a hand at the back. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it was indeed a pleasure. Oh. Thank you so much.